Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about evolving whistled languages and how the brain shapes uh, linguistic structure. Can you all hear me? Okay. So uh, no species on this uh, planet other than humans uh, uses a system for communication that is uh, as intricate as human language. So how did we get from uh, the, the chirps and howls of monkeys and apes to the, the sophisticated signal uh, that we use now for language? Now this is a question that has fascinated researchers already for a very long time. Um, unfortunately, though, it is not a question that it's easy to answer. Um, so, there is no, basically no tangible evidence available that we can use, because uh, behaviors like language uh, don't fossilize. And also, uh, written language is a relatively recent invention. So, that is also not something that we can use um, to study the real, really the origins of language. So, um, the field of language evolution uh, is a field that is, uh, has a history uh, that is not without problems. Um, so for a long time, many of the theories that were proposed about this topic were just um, basically fruitless speculation. So they were not based on any real evidence. And in response to this, the uh, Linguistic Society of Paris in 1866 even uh, decided to formulate an official ban um, that uh, forbid any uh, communication or discussion about the evolution of language, or about the origins of language. Um, so that was a great setback for the field. Although it didn't, it didn't really, um, uh, it didn't really cause people to stop thinking or uh, writing about these, uh, about this, this topic. Um, it is what makes us human. So people are always interested to find out uh, what's behind it. But in addition to this, the uh, early theories from that time were even given uh, nicknames to make fun of these. So, uh, for instance, um, the Yogi Ho theory was used as a name for the for the idea that um, that that speech started as uh, chants and grunts that people would produce when they were doing physical activities together while trying to cooperate or work work together and coordinate their actions. Um, and for instance, the Lala theory was used for the idea that speech came from song, which is actually now a theory that is starting to uh, become a little bit more popular again. So in the meantime, luckily a lot has changed. And um, not only in the field of linguistics, but also uh, from many other different dis uh, disciplines, people are starting to use um, exciting and creative techniques to, to, to study language evolution. And I'm now going to show um, uh, a video that, uh, is a, that shows a fragment uh, of a study um, from the field of artificial intelligence, where um, the group of Professor Luke Steels in Brussels, they are using robots to find out how language may uh, get off the ground. And this is a, a very short uh, fragment from uh, an episode of Through the Warm Hole. And these robots are trying to agree on words for body movements. So this is, an, uh, this is an example from the field of artificial intelligence. But in addition, uh, other fields such as uh, genetics uh, also contribute to, this, uh, to, to, to questions about language evolution. So geneticists are, for instance, trying to find genes that are related to language. Uh, but also paleontologists are trying to look at bones that may uh, say something about how the vocal tract evolved. Um, also biologists are studying um, uh, the behaviors of other species like ape vocalizations or bird song. And um, since relatively recently, it has become popular as well uh, in the field to conduct studies with human participants uh, in the laboratory. And um, I'm going to, to present an example of such a study. 
So to uh, explain the setup of this type of experiments, um, we usually compare this with the game of telephone or broken telephone. So who has ever played the game of, of broken telephone? And um, did it ever happen that the message that came out in the end was the same as the message that uh, was originally uh, uh, invented by the first person? No. Okay, so this game, in this game, a, a message or a phrase is passed on from person to person by whispering it from ear to ear. And when it reaches the last person in the group, this person has to um, say what, what he or she thought the message was. And usually this is something completely different than, than the original message. Um, in other words, this message has kind of evolved. Um, and in essence, um, this game shows what, what can happen to real languages as well when languages are transmitted from generation to generation or from parents to children, children to uh, grandchildren and so on. Um, so and this process that um, from, uh, passing on from generation to generation, we call that cultural e evolution. And um, this is something that can be um, simulated in the lab by playing this game of telephone, but not with uh, short messages only, but by transmitting whole miniature language systems. So in such an experiment, um, a participant would come into the lab and we ask them um, to learn a language which is small enough that it can be learned within one hour. Uh, ne uh, next, we ask them to reproduce the words of that language. And those words, those reproductions, are then used to uh, train the next person who comes into the lab, and so on. So in this way, we create a chain of transmission, and we simulate um, a sort of miniature uh, cultural evolution. So the, uh, the question that I was interested in in this study was where does structure in speech come from? Um, so um, speech is organized, uh, it is built up out of basic building blocks, so there are meaningless sounds that are combined uh, in a systematic way uh, to create words. And complex um, rules and structures define which sounds are correct in a language and which combination of sounds uh, can be used in that language. And this can differ from one language uh, to the other. Um, but of course, natural languages uh, already have this kind of structure. So in the experiments, we needed to come up with something uh, different than the use of, uh, of, of real human language. Um, so these, these participants, we didn't teach them uh, an existing spoken language, um, but we exposed them to uh, an artificial, made-up, uh, whistled language. And the words uh, for this language were um, produced with a slight whistle, so one of these. Um, so a word in that language could some, sound something like this. For instance. Um, so what we did, we, we ran four parallel uh, language evolutions. So uh, each of these chains uh, started with the same uh, random source language. And then this language was passed on ten times from uh, person to person. And here are some examples from um, one of those source languages. So. Um, Basically, the, the, these sounds were produced by people who were just um, invited into the lab and we told them, just produce some random sounds. Um, so there was no structure at all uh, in these sounds and there were no basic building blocks that reappeared in other sounds in that same set. So this is what uh, these sound like. So here they are plotted as uh, pitch tracks. real languages have, um, in real languages, words have meanings as well. 
So uh, in one of these experiments, we wanted to make sure that these whistles were truly novel words for novel items as well. Um, and what we did uh, was we told the participants a story um, where we said that, uh, they were, they, that uh, a spaceship has cr uh, had crashed on Earth and uh, that it was their task to help the aliens uh, repair their spaceship. And to be able to do this correctly, uh, they needed to learn the words for these uh, UFO spaceship parts from an alien language. So then, uh, to investigate these uh, evolved whistled languages, we can look at what, uh, one, uh, what a person in, in one of these chains, what the last person in one of these chains uh, produced. Um, and if we look closely, we can see that it has gained a, a type of structure that is very similar to what we see in, uh, in real languages. Um, so there is, uh, you, you can clearly see in here that there is a, 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 um, a basic set of, uh, of building blocks. So this one. This one. And this. And these elements are, are reused and combined in a systematic way. So remember that that was also what we saw um, in, in real languages. And then if we combine the results of these four chains together, we can also uh, measure that there is a, a significant increase of structure um, towards the end of these, uh, of these transmission chains. Um, and structure here refers to this, this emergence and reuse of, of basic elements, basic building blocks. And we can also see that these languages become more learnable over time. So apparently, um, uh, after a certain amount, of a certain number of these transmissions, um, the, the languages become easier for people to remember. So what can we learn from this? Um, so experiments of this kind uh, show that regularities and structure can arise and grow in languages as these, these languages are transmitted from uh, existing users of a language community to new learners. And every generation of speakers changes these languages um, little by little without even being aware of it uh, consciously. So researchers in the field have identified that um, Basically, this process of transmission puts uh, a selective pressure on these evolving languages. And this selection favors uh, those structures that are easy to learn. So structures or words that people cannot remember, they will also not reproduce. So um, in the end, those are the structures that will disappear. While on the other hand, structures that are very easy to remember uh, will be faithfully transmitted. So languages have to pass through a very narrow uh, bottleneck that is created by, by um, the brains of language learners. Um, and these languages have to adapt to the cognitive biases of these brains. Um, and that is how cultural transmission, together with these cognitive biases, um, shape linguistic structure. Thank you.